who are continuing distinguished uh, general lecture series. Um, today, we have Lillian Park, an old friend of NYI also, who was in St. Petersburg with us, we figured out in 2013, so almost 10 years ago. Um, and oh, yes, so now we've become the recording. So I again like to welcome Lillian Park, who was with us in St. Petersburg. Um, nine years ago in 2013, old friend of NYI. Lillian is uh, Associate Professor of Psychology and Chair of the Psychology Department in uh, at SUNY Old Westbury, so a sister campus of, of ours. Um, she has a PhD in psychology from University of California, Berkeley. Um, she's also uh, done postdoctoral research at uh, the Rotman Research Institute in Toronto. She's interested in memory processes, autobiographical narratives, uh, and also scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, and she lives in New York uh, with her husband, son, and dog. Um, maybe we'll get to see her dog today if we're lucky. Um, but in any event, we are very happy to have you, Lillian. Thanks for doing this. And she's going to talk to us today about unspeakable emotions, the power of putting words to feelings. Um, so please welcome Lillian Park. Oh, uh, it's really wonderful to be back. Um, I'm going to start my screen and uh, share my PowerPoint. Um, and if at any point uh, my sound uh, gets bad, please just let me know and I'll change some settings to, to get this, uh, to get uh, my mic working again. Um, so I was really uh, delighted and honored that uh, John asked me uh, to come back. Um, I won um, when I was in St. Petersburg. Uh, nine years ago, uh, I came to one of these lecture series and uh, the speaker started off with a little introduction. I liked it, so I decided to uh, do a little bit of my own. So uh, this was me nine years ago. This was actually a photo taken from one of the events in St. Petersburg. Uh, so back then, uh, I was an assistant professor. Um, and this is me now, where I'm now an associate professor and the chair of the psychology department. And in between those years, here's everything that happened to me. Um, I bought a house, I moved to Brooklyn, I got married, I got tenured and promoted. Um, the pandemic happened uh, and I gave birth to a baby boy and I moved back to New Jersey. So um, everything sort of came back to a full circle. Uh, you know, in 2013, I was living in New Jersey, um, and now I am back in New Jersey. Um, so here, so uh, you know, everything uh, always seems to um, just come to where it needs to be. So, uh, in case you're curious of where exactly I work, um, so this is a map of Long Island. New York City is right here with all of the five boroughs, and then um, out on this huge island. Uh, Long Island, uh, here this blue star represents where my campus, SUNY Old Westbury, is located. Um, and John's campus is like somewhere out here in like the wilderness somewhere. All the way out there in the wilderness. Uh, so uh, so that's a little bit about me. Um, and this talk is going to be a little bit different because normally, uh, you know, in these lectures, uh, people talk about the work that they have just recently completed or perhaps they've just published. Uh, since becoming a chair, my research uh, just really sort of, you know, um, I really haven't had a whole lot of time to devote to research. Um, and uh, I will be uh, ending my tenure as being chair soon. So I've started thinking about what I would like to do once I start having more time. And I've been spending a lot of time thinking about future directions that I would like to go in. So uh, this lecture is actually going to be talking about um, a future project that I am thinking of working on. So, you know, the idea is very fresh and new to me. Um, and, you know, and I absolutely would love to hear your thoughts and any feedback and any questions that you guys might have. Um, and, you know, um, so, you know, please 
you know, understand that, uh, you know, this, you know, the presentation that I'm doing um, in terms of the research project idea is not a, a fully formed finished idea. This is something that I've been uh, thinking about and working on and I will continue to work on um, while I'm chair and then hopefully uh, be able to actually start this uh, sometime uh, in, you know, the next year or two. Uh, so let's get on with it. Um, so I wanted to talk about emotion. Um, and I'm interested in, um, you know, broadly speaking, I'm interested in uh, the relationship between language and emotion. So before we get started, let's first talk about what exactly is emotion. Um, and emotion is um, a response and it involves three different components. Um, a physiological arousal, which has to do with, um, you know, physical changes in your body, like breathing, heart rate, um, you know, your sweat glands, expressive behavior, uh, you know, your facial expressions, your bodily expressions, and the conscious experience, the actual experience that you have of the emotion. And emotions are elicited by objects, events, and people real or imagined. So we don't have to actually physically experience, we can just simply imagine something. So for example, imagine how it, you would feel if you're uh, seeing a loved one that you haven't seen for a really long time. You're seeing them for the first time after a really long separation. Um, so, you know, for example, during the pandemic, I, ha I wasn't able to see my parents uh, for a very long time. They, um, you know, weren't able to meet their grandson. My father wasn't able to meet his grandson until he was almost a year old. And so, um, you know, just imagining their, you know, the, their first meeting made me really happy and very weepy, you know, so emotions are things that are elicited um, by not just simply us experiencing that, but in us imagining how things could play out. Um, so the question about, you know, what exactly are emotions um, and whether emotions are universal, meaning that everywhere around the world, regardless of culture or time, um, experience the same set of emotions and experience emotions the same way, or whether emotions are culturally specific, meaning that the emotions that you experience are a function of the culture and the society and the time that you're in. Um, it's a really long-standing question. Uh, and uh, one of the first studies uh, to look at this question of emotion was done by Paul Ekman. So in 1967, Paul Ekman went to Papua New Guinea uh, to study uh, nonverbal behavior in the four people. So uh, these um, the four people in Papua New Guinea uh, at that time point, had very little contact with Western culture. So it um, and. But Paul Ekman was very much interested in studying them because all of the previous studies looking at emotions, you know, if they went to various different countries to look at whether uh, emotions were universal or if it was something culturally specific, they, you know, all of these various different cultures, whether it was the United States or Europe, had a lot of contact with each other. Um, so there was a lot of exchanges of information happening uh, between the countries. And so, uh, you know, it, it was very difficult for scientists to figure out, well, you know, do people express happiness the same way because it's universal or is this just something that we've all learned to express in the same way because we've all had so much contact with each other. So uh, the four people in Papua New Guinea had very little exposure to Western culture. So these were people who were isolated um, on an island. And so he felt that, okay, uh, you know, this is the best chance of studying emotions. And if, you know, these people, if they express happiness or any other emotions the same way as people do in Western cultures, then we can make a much stronger argument that uh, emotions are universal rather than being culturally specific. So what he did is he recruited them uh, and he would give them little vignettes um, and, you know, ask them, you know, could you please show me what you would look like if, um, you know, if a young, if, you know, if a young child died, could you please show me what you would look like if, you know, um, you hunted and successfully killed a large pig. 
Uh, so, you know, he would ask them to express their emotions. And what he found was that certain emotions um, they displayed looked very much like the emotions that he, he saw in uh, people in Western cultures. So uh, Paul Ekman concluded that certain emotions, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, dis disgust, um, are universal emotions uh, because uh, these emotions uh, people express in the same way, meaning that, you know, when people are showing happiness, uh, the facial expressions that we give, uh, we all use the same eye and mouth muscles, um, you know, regardless of where we are, um, you know, in terms of, you know, our cultures. And so here are the basic emotions. six basic emotions. There's also been um, uh, more recently, uh, people um, ha have proposed that perhaps there is a seventh basic emotion being content. But um, there's been further uh, studies of giving um, further support to the idea that, you know, these emotions are basic emotions. So for example, very young babies, um, you know, regardless of uh, of which culture they are born to, all ex display the same facial expressions for these particular set of emotions. Um, and you know, and these are very young babies. They had, you know, they come into the world not knowing anything, um, and they display the same. You know, um, when they're smile, uh, you know, when they're happy, they they uh, they smile. No one had to teach them how to smile. They just spontaneously do it. Um, and then there was uh, the study that I really um, uh, like that was done by Matsumoto uh, in 2009, uh, where he recruited uh, athletes. Uh, so, um, and some of the athletes that he recruited uh, have been blind since birth. Um, and he went to their various, um, and he went and he found pictures of these various different um, athletes sighted athletes and blind athletes. Uh, and he got pictures of them right after um, a very important uh, tournament. So, um, and what he found was that, so here is a, uh, an athlete, a blind athlete, right after she had lost a very important match. And this athlete had been blind since birth. Uh, and again, these these basic emotions, from, you know, of happiness and sadness, uh, were exactly the same as uh, sighted athletes. Again, uh, you know, providing further support for the idea that there are certain emotions that are basic, universal emotions that we come into this world. Uh, these emotions are innate, uh, and we experience them the same way. And emotions um, can be uh, classified or characterized along the two different um, dimensions, one being pleasant to unpleasant. So emotions differ on how pleasant they are. So something like happiness is pleasant, whereas on the other hand, uh, sadness is not pleasant. Um, and also, of course, uh, emotions vary in terms of intensity. So some emotions are very intense. So excitement is a very intense emotion, uh, whereas something like serenity is a much less intense emotion. And so along, um, so all emotions uh, can be mapped along these two different axes. Um, and the other um, thing that we know is that countries, um, so, you know, although certain um, emotions, the six basic emotions um, are universal, and we believe that people experience the same way. Um, we certainly know that uh, cultures vary in terms of, uh, you know, how people express these emotions. So while, you know, in the inside um, for these basic emotions, we believe that people experience the emotions in very similar ways. Uh, you know, you, um, you know, depending upon the culture and the time period, and also, of course, um, your gender, uh, you, you know, how people choose to outwardly express these emotions are going to be different. 
And so, um, you know, in the study, they mapped out exactly, you know, how countries uh, vary in terms of how emotionally expressive they are. So uh, certain countries like Brazil, Russia, Italian, uh, Italy, sorry, um, are far more emotionally expressive, whereas other countries like the Netherlands, Korea, Japan are less emotionally expressive, and that also countries can vary in terms of how confrontational uh, they are. So um, uh, Koreans, uh, Asian countries tend to be less confrontational. Uh, they, you know, um, if there is some sort of disagreement or argument, they try to avoid it or they try to uh, approach it in a very roundabout manner. Um, and then there are other countries where, you know, people are far more direct. Um, so, for example, in Germany, uh, people tend to be quite direct with you. So, you know, of, <laughs> so, for example, uh, you, you know, um, I used to spend a lot of time in Germany. And, you know, if you did something wrong, uh, you know, little old grandmothers had absolutely no problems coming right up to you and telling you exactly what you did wrong. So, you know, if you accidentally dropped uh, something and you know you took a little too long to pick it up they will come up to you and like you know start telling you that you know you shouldn't um, you shouldn't have dropped that uh, piece of paper um, so you know these are all part of cultural norms and of course uh, you know we know that um, there are uh, gender norms in terms of um, emotional expression so um, in the United States uh, it tends to be more acceptable for men to express negative emotions and women, um, it's not as acceptable for women to express, you know, negative emotions such as anger. So um, I talked about, um, you know, basic um, universal expressions, but, you know, uh, or emotions, but there are, you know, far more many emotions. Um, there are complex emotions like love and guilt, regret, awe, embarrassment. Um, and complex emotions are very different than basic emotions because complex emotions are a composite of basic emotions. Um, they have varied facial expressions. So whereas um, basic emotions, you know, when people are demonstrating happiness, we all tend to make the same sort of face. For these complex emotions, the facial expressions tend to vary, they tend to differ. Um, and it's also far more difficult for people to determine just based on the facial expressions and know what exactly the emotion is. Um, with the basic emotions, I can show uh, people uh, the facial expression without any context, without any um, explanation without any further uh, information. And people can are pretty good about figuring out, oh, you know, that person is showing a sadness, that person is showing anger. Whereas for complex emotions, uh, and, uh, you know, people need further information in order to discern what the emotion is. They can't just simply look at the face without any context and know exactly um, what, what emotion that person is experiencing. Um, complex also, emotions also require cognitive processing. Uh, so, you know, a, for a lot of these emotions, um, there's actually a, quite a bit of cognitive thought going in. For example, regret is something uh, that I find very interesting because what, um, what I find so interesting about regret is that uh, regret only happens when you're thinking about something that never happened at all. You can't experience regret unless you are able to imagine a different alternative situation, a different alternative past. Um, so the ability to feel regret very much is predicated on the on your ability to imagine a situation that never happened. You have to create something in order to feel this emotion. Uh, and that's true for a lot of these complex emotions is that, you know, it requires us to uh, devote a fair amount of cognitive processes uh, into them. Um, and also uh, complex emotions um, can contain culturally specific uh, values and meaning. Um, so there are certain um, so there are certain emotions that certain cultures have uh, that other cultures don't have. So, for example, um, 
Um, I'm Korean. Uh, there is this very particular word in Korea, uh, in Korean, uh, Han, uh, and that emotional concept, the, there is no direct translation in English for Han. Uh, uh, Han uh, the best way for me to explain Han is to say that it is this mixture of anger and regret and um, sorrow and pain and trauma and this, this deep yearning and desire for resolution uh, for some sort of, you know, uh, unforgivable um, troubled past or misdeed. Um, and, you know, uh, and there is no word in English that really captures this emotional word Han. Uh, you know, every Korean, if you go to Korea, every Korean in Korea knows what this word is. It, 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 is, it is a very specific, you know, it's a very culturally specific word and emotion. And there's nothing in English that properly captures the immense uh, emotional complexity of this concept. Um, you know, the best I can do is just sort of uh, talk about various different emotions that go into it and talk about the various different situations that I feel will, uh, uh, that explain what Han is. But, you know, this is something, you know, this is something that's specific to Korean culture. Um, and, you know, there are other um, words that I've encountered. Uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, there was um, this Danish word for coziness, uh, higi, which was that suddenly became popular in the United States. Uh, and, you know, and I, it's also very similar to what I think um, the Germans would refer to as gemütlichkeit. Uh, and it's this idea of coziness, but it's a certain type of coziness. Um, and there's no proper English word for it. So, um, so complex emotions. Um, you know, unlike basic emotions, which are universal and can be ex uh, experienced by everybody, uh, complex emotions can have very specific cultural values and meaning that are, you know, to a particular culture. It's not to say that other cultures, people of other cultures can't experience these same emotions and situations. It's just simply that they might not have a word to encapsulate the entire experience. Um, so, so this is the part where I will start talking about, uh, where I start approaching my interest um, on this subject. So I'm interested in the relationship of language and emotions, and I specifically wanted to look at this in, uh, in bilingual speakers. Um, so there are two basic competing theories in trying to explain uh, the relationship of language and emotions in bilingual speakers. Um, one is the detachment effect theory, um, which is this idea that when a bilingual speaker thinks in their second language, L2, uh, there's going to be less emotional reactivity. Uh, so um, a bilingual, you know, and the, the idea here is that, you know, it has to do with how many bilingual speakers happen to acquire their second language. This isn't true for all, but for many um, bilingual speakers, uh, how they acquire their second language happens to be later in life. It tends to be in school. Um, and so uh, the idea here is that because the acquisition of the second language, you know, happened in a different context and in a more um, you know, in a less emotional uh, setting, whereas, you know, L1, your first language is learned at home and there's, you know, very much, um, you know, far more greater emphasis on emotions uh, at home that, you know, your first language, you learn to associate emotions with these various different words, with these various different um, emotional words in that language. You know, so um, if I were to, you know, take any one of you um, and attach electrodes to you and have you read aloud various different emotional words, you know, uh, compared to neutral words, you know, I can actually measure these very tiny physiological changes that are just sort of naturally elicited by emotional words. 
Um, but the idea is that for people who acquire their second language later in life um, and in school settings, that same sort of emotional connection doesn't happen. So, uh, you know, for example, um, I learned French, you know, when I was much older um, and I learned it at school. Uh, you know, if I'm into, you know, if I were to read uh, the French word for sad, you know, for sad, triste, um, it's not going to elicit the same sort of emotional reaction uh, in me because, you know, I don't form the same sort of emotional associations in relationship to that word because, you know, I learned it in a very different type of school setting um, versus, you know, learning at home, um, you know, interacting with people um, and, you know, um, having it sort of like occur naturally in various different situations. Um, and there have been other studies, um, you know, uh, lending support to this idea. So, for example, uh, participants um, have rated swear words and taboo words as being less intense, less taboo uh, in their second language. So when they're speaking in their uh, first language, taboo words, um, you know, these are like, you know, curse words, you know, words that are, you know, vulgar, uh, feel very uh, emotionally intense, um, and dirty uh, in their first language and in the second language, you know, they don't have that same, you know, uh, in, intense emotional connection. Um, you know, and I know from personal experience, you know, uh, you know, people, um, you know, my friends who, who spoke English as their second language, you know, they told me like, oh yeah, you know, um, they're far more casual in terms of like swearing a lot more in English because to them, it's just a funny thing they say. It, it's not the same sort of emotional connection that they have to the word that they would in their first language. Um, and other studies um, have found that, you know, because of this emotional detachment that you have uh, to the second language, that it could possibly have some very interesting consequences. So bilingual speakers have reported that they found it much easier to lie in the second language. Um, and, you know, the reason why is because, again, it's not that same sort of emotion, you know, there's uh, emotional connection and there's the sense of detachment. And so they feel that it's not as personal personal to them. Um, uh, also, interestingly, um, um, you know, studies have found that, you know, perhaps because of this emotional detachment, uh, bilingual speakers might actually make better decisions in the second language. Um, you know, a lot, you know, we like to think of ourselves as being these really rational decision makers, but in reality, we're not. We're very much emotional creatures. And I, I'm not saying this as a pejorative. I think emotions are really important. And emotions is what helps guide us in making good decisions, but certainly there are times where emotions can lead us astray. Um, and um, when you have bilingual speakers making decisions in the second language, because they don't feel the same, you know, intense emotions, they're actually able to make uh, you know, we actually find that there's a reduction uh, in these biases that uh, that would normally otherwise appear. Um, so, uh, you know, they're able to make more what we call, you know, in decision making, what they consider to be more rational, utilitarian decisions. Uh, so the very famous, um, you know, thought question in decision making is what we call the footbridge problem, which is um, this idea, uh, you know, it, it was proposed by a philosopher. So you're standing over a bridge, there's a runaway trolley train, um, and there's a person, uh, and there are five people tied to the railroad tracks. And this runaway trolley train is about to kill and run over all of those five people who are tied down to the tracks. And the question is, is would you push a person over in order to stop the trolley track uh, the trolley train, so that way you could save those five people. So the question is, would you kill one person in order to save five people? Most people would say, no, absolutely not, because the thought of, you know, killing someone, even if it is to save more lives, is something that, you know, emotionally we find very difficult to resolve. 
uh, but when you ask this, you know, but when you ask questions like this in the second language, uh, people are more able to make what is considered to be the rational decision, uh, because again, uh, these problems when they're presented in the second language don't come with the same emotional baggage that it would in the first language. So that's the, so that is uh, one idea of the relationship of language emotions in bilingual speakers is that when you're speaking in the same language, or sorry, when you're speaking in the second language, it's just not as emotional, it's not as intense. Um, the other competing theory uh, is uh, it goes by two different names: the cultural frame switching perspective, um, um, and it also goes by the emotional frame switching. Um, and the idea here uh, is not that the second language is less emotional, uh, but that the rules and the culture that come with those languages are different and that people will selectively choose to use one language or the other, depending upon the emotion and depending upon the situation. Uh, you know, so uh, bilingual speakers will code switch or selectively choose a particular language that is the most appropriate for the culturally expected patterns of emotion. Um, so, so Pavlenko in 2005 reported that Chinese in Chinese uh, American families, uh, a parent, you know, the Chinese parents will actually choose to tell their children "I love you" in English rather than in Cantonese or in Mandarin. Um, and you might wonder, well, okay, so, you know, and if you think about this from the uh, previous perspective, which is the emotional detachment, you would think, well, that's kind of weird. Um, English is their second language. Why would they choose uh, to express this very, you know, uh, deep and loving emotion in a second language, you know, to be more distanced from it? Um, and Pavlenko said that, no, it's actually quite the opposite. Uh, you know, and this is something that I can verify coming from, you know, um, the Korean culture, you know, in Asian cultures, uh, you pair, it might be a little bit different now, but certainly growing up, parents did not tell their children that they loved them. You know, until I was in high school, I had no idea that Korean even had a word for love. Um, it just was not something that parents did. Um, and so the reason why the Chinese parents were switching to English to tell I love you for the children was because, you know, in the English language, in the American culture, you know, you express uh, I love you and you express um, the emotions of love uh, far more readily. And so the parents were switching into English because that was the more, you know, that was more culturally acceptable. Um, so they were doing this. Uh, you know, as not as a way of down regulating the emotion, but as a way of up regulating the emotion to feel it more intensely because, you know, the English language, the American culture permitted the parents to say the words that they uh, love their children to express those emotions. Whereas, you know, it's not something that the, uh, the Chinese culture, that Asian cultures, it's not something that's really done um, in that same way. Um, and also, you know, at, um, and I talked about this earlier uh, in my introduction, you know, there are cultural differences um, in emotion words. So uh, you might switch languages um, because there's a particular word um, that one language has uh, that best expresses your emotion, uh, but, you know, the other language might not have. So, um, <clears throat> you know, so you might switch languages because you're like, oh, um, I know how to express this emotion in one language and I can't do it in the other language. Um, and, you know, and as I've, uh, you know, also have said before, you know, uh, countries and cultures differ in terms of, you know, how emotionally expressive uh, the people are and also how uh, confrontational uh, they are. So what, you know, so, so where am I trying to go to? Um, so, you know, I wanted to, you know, so we have these two competing theories um, about uh, the role that uh, language plays in emotions that, you know, you use, you know, if you're the one is this idea that by going into your second language is that you're trying to downregulate uh, your emotions, um, and the other one, um, and then you have this other, um, um, and then you have this other theory, the emotional, um, 
uh, switching uh, perspective, which is uh, the idea that it's not really about whether it's the first language or the second language. It really has to do with what the culture says is, um, you know, socially and culturally acceptable. Um, and, you know, and, and a lot of these studies looking at the role of language uh, and emotions um, in bilingual speakers uh, have the same set of, share the same set of limitations. One has to do with, you know, fluency differences in the first language and the second language. This is just sort of like the standard problem that uh, is always, that always comes across um, when you're doing work with bilingual speakers is because, you know, finding somebody who is a, a true balanced bilingual, somebody who can speak both languages fluently and is also bicultural, it's relatively difficult to find. Um, and, and, you know, in the United States, it's quite difficult to find. Um, you know, I grew up speaking Korean, but, you know, culturally speaking, I'm an American. My English is much, you know, I'm far more fluent in English than I am in Korean. So, you know, there are differences there. Um, it's also difficult to figure out cultural, uh, to separate out cultural expectations and norms of language and emotions in bilingual studies. So in a lot of these uh, bilingual studies, when they're asking uh, bilingual uh, speakers, you know, when they're trying to um, figure out what is the role that language is playing in emotion, um, it's really hard to separate out the cultural um, and, you know, and, and also like gender expectations and the norms of language. Like, so for example, in the study about lying, um, you know, when you're asking people to lie, lie is very specific and personal to you. For example, I don't like beer. So if I say the statement, I love beer, that is a lie. And, you know, it is, there's no way to do that study unless it's specifically, you know, um, it, it's specifically about you. Um, and so, you know, to say that, you know, it has to do with the role of, you know, it's specific, there's something about language versus, you know, all of this other, um, cultural and societal things that come in, it's very difficult to separate out. And, and you know, again, um, gender roles and expectations of emotion um, expression. Uh, you know, some years ago, you know, uh, when people were looking at emotions, in, uh, you know, the cultural differences in emotions, people wondered, well, you know, do... Um, Asian cultures even uh, experience emotions because, you know, they were finding that their participants were fairly stoic. Um, and so they did this very clever study in which they would present various different film clips. And in one condition, um, the Asian participants were just alone in a room uh, versus, you know, being, uh, they were, you know, watching the same, uh, and another group of um, Asian participants were in a room, but they were with other people. And what they found was that, oh, when the Asian participants were alone in a room, their emotional expressions looked just like the American participants. But when they were in a room with other people, you know, they, they tended to adopt um, a more neutral expression because again, in the Asian culture, um, if you are, particularly if you're male, um, expressions of emotion are not considered, you know, societally appropriate. Like that's something like little kids do. That's not something adults do. And so um, trying to understand, you know, so it's very difficult to try to, uh, you know, understand the relationship uh, when, you know, there's a lot of cultural and societal um, expectations that come along with this. So um, I wanted to take a look at this. Um, and, um, you know, there's a, there's a, per, a, a paradigm, uh, what's known as affect labeling um, in uh, cognitive um, and um, uh, affective neuroscience. Um, and how affect labeling works um, is that you present participants uh, with a picture, and then you ask them to choose which label best describes uh, that picture. So, um, and what they found, um, you know, doing this with, you know, this is with mono, this is with um, monolingual speakers, 
um, is that when participants, you know, are looking at pictures and they select the appropriate label to go with that picture, is that uh, what happens is that the negative emotions that's elicited by the photo actually gets reduced. So if I were to show you the same picture, but ask you to make a different type of categorization, um, say, for example, uh, you know, identify whether this is a male or a female, um, you know, we're not going to find, it's not the act of labeling that uh, just simply the labeling alone that uh, results in the reduction of the negative emotion. It has to do with actually placing um, the appropriate label to the emotion to reduce um, the negative emotion. Um, and, the, you know, and a lot of work has come out of affective labeling and has had a lot of impact on the therapy where, you know, you know, there's this idea that um, when you are experiencing negative emotions, it's really important to be able to name the, uh, the emotion that you're feeling. And that is what's going to help you regulate your emotion um, and deal with um, you know, and deal with the negative, um, you know, emotions that come with, uh, with it. So I wanted, so this is, so this is the paradigm that I'm actually interested in because I thought that, um, what I thought that this perhaps would allow me to sort of be able to accept escape more of the cultural and societal, you know, expectations about people. Because again, you know, when I, um, a lot of these previous studies looking in bilingual speakers um, and looking at the role of language and their emotions, um, they were really asking their speakers to place themselves um, and their feelings into the study. Whereas, you know, if I were to use this paradigm, I'm actually removing it because I'm not asking them to label their emotions. I'm just saying, here's a picture and label the emotion. And uh, so this was a study that was uh, in affect labeling that was done um, with monolingual speakers. Um, and, you know, um, and what they found in this fMRI study was that when speakers are labeling negative emotions, there is this reduction in activation in the amygdala. And the amygdala is this um, structure deep inside of the brain um, in the temporal lobe uh, and is specifically associated with negative emotions, particularly fear. Uh, and if um, and when participants are engaging in affect labeling uh, compared to other types of categorization, other types of labeling, we see this reduction of activation uh, in the amygdala. So being able to label uh, the negative emotions reduces the amount of negative emotions felt by um, the uh, participants. So I wanted to take a look at this. Um, I'm not, and the, the study that I'm proposing um, is not going to be doing, it's not an fMRI study because I teach at a very small school. We don't have an fMRI machines. They're very expensive. They cost millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but what we do have uh, is an EEG. Um, and what an EEG is are little electrodes that you attach all over people's heads. Uh, and I can measure brain signals. Um, and there's this particular um, waveform known as the late positive potential, the LPP, um, that specifically, uh, that several studies have found that specifically has to do with emotions. So uh, particularly negative emotions. So when negative emotions um, are being felt or elicited, then we see this LPP activation in participants. So uh, I wanted to, so I wanted to uh, take a look at the LPP um, and you know test these two competing theories: the emotional uh, the emotional detachment theory and the emotion frame switching theory, um, and see. Uh, uh, and see what would happen. So if there's emotion detaching happening in L2, then what should happen is, is that when you ask bilingual speakers to engage in um, affect labeling, uh, then in their second language, uh, what should happen is that there's going to be a reduction of um, the LPP. 
Okay, so that, that is the prediction that's going to be made. Um, on the other hand, if we think that, you know, uh, what's happening with language, it has more to do with the emotion and the cultural appropriateness of that emotion for that, um, for, in that language, uh, then, you know, whether, you know, whether the label is happening in L1, it's, we're not gonna necessarily see a reduction in um, the LPP uh, in the second language. It has to do with what the cultural norms are. So, um, you know, so for example, um, you know, based upon the uh, previous study or, or that I mentioned, um, where it's, you know, they said that emotions, um, you know, the Russian cultures, um, it's more culturally acceptable to be more emotionally expressive in the Russian culture compared to the American culture. So if we have a bilingual speaker who has English uh, as L1 and Russian as L2, then we should see a greater reduction of negative emotions uh, in using English for affect labeling rather than emotions, because uh, in the Russian language, being emotionally uh, expressive is more accepted, it's more culturally permissive. So uh, this is one, you know, this is how an EEG uh, could look. So um, they come in various different types, um, but you have, this is one example. So you have a participant uh, and you have various different electrodes all over their scalp. And then, um, and, it, and these electrodes measure brain activation as you present stimulus to them or as they complete um, different tasks. Uh, and this is the late positive potential, the LPP. And so whenever there's a negative emotion, there is greater activation uh, compared to more positive or neutral stimulus. So what I am, uh, so the study that I'm thinking of, of um, the first study, what's going to happen is um, I am, you know, going through the steps, talking about it as if I have Russian English bilinguals at my disposal. In reality, I would probably use a different set of bilinguals uh, because uh, we have a few at Old Westbury. There are a few Russian speakers, but not that many. So I will probably be forced to do this with uh, bilinguals so I, I can find more readily uh, on Long Island. Um, so, uh, it, um, so in uh, the English condition, you know, we present pictures um, and I ask people to label, to choose the label that most appropriately describes the picture that they're seeing. Uh, and, you know, if they're doing this in Russian, it would look something like this. Um, I'm only, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to God that Google Translate gave me the correct words. <laughs> I don't read Russian, I don't know Russian. Uh, so, uh, uh, so anyway, I'm hoping that Google Translate did a good job of translating. Um, and the control task uh, would be gender, gender labeling, which, um, uh, which is, you know, you would, again, present the same uh, faces um, and the same emotional expression, but rather than labeling them um, as uh, according to their emotions, you would ask which name, uh, you know, would be the most appropriate. And then this would be the Russian equivalent. And again, I'm hoping that Google Translate did it. Okay. Um, so the idea, um, so that would be the first study. Um, and what I would expect to see is that uh, in English, because the idea is that, you know, um, um, is that because in the English language, negative emotions, uh, express, expression of negative emotions is not as uh, socially acceptable as in Russian, that we would see a greater reduction uh, of the LPP when they're doing the labeling um, in English um, compared to in Russian. Um, you know, if, you know, so, so if we see this happening, that would be support for the emotional uh, uh, switching uh, perspective, but you know, if we expect to see the uh, emotion, deta you know, uh, detachment theory being supported, then it sh then we should see greater reduction in uh, Russian. Uh, 
Um, and the other study that, uh, the follow-up study that I'm proposing is that I wanted to see, well, okay, so in the, what I liked about um, how I, the first study is that I'm not asking people to put themselves in it. Um, you know, they're looking at pictures of other people um, and it removes a lot of, you know, you know, is this socially acceptable? Is this culturally ex acceptable? Um, and it's, you know, I, and I feel that this particular paradigm does a better job of just trying to look at the role of language and emotion and trying to remove as much of like the cultural and personal and gender expressions and expectations from it. Um, and, and then in the second study, uh, as a follow-up to it, um, you know, what I would do is I would say, well, okay, um, well, what happens when you ask people, you know, to look at these emotions, but now to think about it in terms of themselves. So they would see a picture, but then I would ask them to answer it and label it as if it was them. So, you know, so they're seeing a picture of somebody else, but, you know, like, you know, um, you know, I am, and then, you know, you're like, um, and asking them to label it as scared or furious, which one is more appropriate? Um, so unlike in the first study where it's not about them, in this one, I am um, having them uh, bring themselves into it. And so I would see, well, okay, um, if it turns out that this, that language, the second language does play a role in removing emotion. So if you switch over into the second language, and there's this attachment. Well, what happens if it then becomes more personalized and we bring um, you into it? Does then, you know, um, the expectations of the culture and societal expressions, does then that play a role? So that's what um, the second study will be taking a look at. So this is how it would look like for English. Um, so in the other condition, you know, um, I'm asking you to remove himself. So uh, she is, and this is what it would look like um, if they were to do it in Russian, I am scared or furious. Um, and so the hypothesis here is that we would see a greater um, uh, 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 activation in the LPP because of the greater expressivity in the, the Russian culture. So, you know, bringing yourself into it, um, you're speaking in Russian where it's more permissible to be emotionally expressive of negative emotions, um, we should see even greater activation. Um, and if that were so, um, you know, and if that were true, uh, you know, this would bring um, greater support for the idea of, you know, um, of saying that, you know, if we're trying to look at the role of, you know, what language does to emotions, uh, we would have to say, well, you know, you know, are we taught, you know, if we're talking about this in terms of like, you know, cultural and social settings, then people will be, you know, we're going to see one set of things. And if we're just, you know, trying to look at the cognitive process, then something else is going on. So this is the uh, she is uh, equivalent. So the implications that these studies, um, it would provide clarity um, on the role of language in emotion processing, because I would be uh, able to separate out the effect of, you know, a more of like the cognitive effects of language having on emotions, uh, and then being able to layer on top of that of what, you know, um, social and cultural um, expressions um, have. Um, you know, as we're using language uh, to talk about emotions. Um, so, you know, so we could also take a look at cultural expressions in emotion uh, processing and language. Um, so that's uh, the goals that I'm hoping to get with, with these particular set of studies. Um, but, you know, uh, the you know, there are, uh, I'm not saying that there's only one limitations. I'm sure there are several limitations um, on this study. Uh, you know, what's really difficult about conducting uh, studies where you're looking in bilingual speakers um, and you're having to deal with um, different cultures is that, you know, when you try to categorize 
languages and cultures as being, you know, more this or less that, you know, people often, um, you know, and people from that culture often dis can disagree with it. So, you know, um, there may be people here in this audience where I'm saying, oh, you know, the Russian culture is more emotionally expressed. There might be people here who really disagree with that and say, no, it's not. Um, and so that's one of the things that, you know, before I actually get into this, you know, I, I need to carefully think about like, you know, what exactly do I mean by emotional expressivity? What exactly you know, um, am I, you know, am I actually uh, trying to describe and categorize the concepts that I'm interested in in the appropriate way? Um, so that's something that I would need to take further look into. Uh, but, you know, this is, um, I think, a very interesting direction. Um, and, you know, I've spent about, you know, a year thinking about this. Um, and I'm going to, um, you know, spend some more time thinking about this before I actually start uh, trying to carry out the study. But, you know, this is the future direction um, that I'm very much interested in going in with my research. Um, so with that, you know, I am absolutely, uh, you know, uh, free to take questions and hear comments. And I would love to hear what your thoughts are. So this is you know, this is brand new territory. I feel very vulnerable here because, you know, I'm like, I'm talking about an idea that's very fresh in you and hasn't been, you know, vetted by a lot of things. So I'm really curious to hear feedback. Uh, yes, Nina. Yes, there was a lot of going on in the chat discussing, especially the last um, uh, examples with the faces and so on. And there is, uh, as a Russian native speaker, what I noticed, which no one else commented so far, um, is that when I looked at the picture with the scared woman and I saw mm -hmm. the uh, word scared and what was the other angry, yeah, right, yeah. Yes, so I thought, oh, it's obviously scared. But then I saw the same picture with the Russian words. And this time I thought that she looked furious instead, but in Russian. Mm, so that's really the same face for me. Mm -hmm. I can interpret it in both ways, depending on the language, apparently. That, so so what, the comment that you made there about how, you know, um, in, in the same face, you see it as scared and as angry in that same face, that's actually really, that's actually something that's really interesting. And, and, and this is something that actually emotion researchers um, have noticed. So um, I presented the, you know, for the context of the study, I kind of <laughs> presented a very simple view and glossed over a lot of controversies, but this idea of the basic emotions being really basic and universally expressed is actually under some debate right now because when you give people these pictures of various different emotions, especially for the negative emotions, um, people will often describe like in the same face, like, oh, I see a little bit of anger or I see a little bit of fear, you know, in in a face that's supposed to be angry, they're like, oh, I see a little bit of fear in there. Or in a face that's supposed to be scared, I see a little bit of anger. Um, so it's not, you know, so people have this idea that perhaps for the negative emotions, they might not be entirely separate categories, but they might be the same emotion. And it's the cognitive labeling that we put into it that makes it different. Um, and, I, and I really thank you for saying that, you know, she looks scared in English, but angry in Russian. Um, that's really interesting. And I don't think anybody has ever really looked at that. And, and I think that would be something that's really interesting uh, to emotion researchers. Um, Nicole, I'm and before you go on with the questions, could you unshare the screen while we have the discussion? Oh, yes. Unless, unless yeah. you need to go back to it. Of course, you can always go back to it at any time. And I just want to we sort of make this transition so that we like first we thank you before we go to the questions. Right? Um, I know everyone's more dying to ask questions, but still, thank you for the presentation. And now we go to the questions. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can take your own. You see them with the hands up, and there's some stuff in the chat going on. So sorry to interrupt. Um, Please carry on. Yeah. Uh, um, no problem. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, yes, it's fine. Um, so I was wondering about the choice of the two languages. I mean, you mentioned that now English and Russian and then said that maybe Russian speakers are not that easily found. But I was wondering whether, I mean, uh, when you look at the drop in the LPP, uh, in L2, uh, 
uh, in that case, wouldn't it be more uh, clearer if you selected two languages uh, that have similar cultures and similar ways to express emotion to really see that drop in L2. I was thinking about, I don't know, Italian and Spanish. We have a very similar way to express emotions. So for bilingual speakers, that drop in the LPP could be more easily easy to see. I was wondering if that's something you have given thought to. Yeah, I'll, that's also another way in which I can go about this. Um, I, you know, what I want to look at, because we have these two competing theories and um, I haven't, you know, uh, you know, I haven't fully worked out everything, um, but I want, what I want is, you know, but uh, because we have these two computers that, that are um, making different predictions, I wanted to see like, okay, is it possible that in the first language we're going to see greater, um, uh, greater reduction, the greater emotional detachment um, because, you know, uh, which is not something that the emotional detachment theory would predict, but because, you know, it is, uh, it is something, uh, but we would see it because that is what uh, is societally um, and socially acceptable. So that was the angle that I was looking at, but, you know, this is something that I'm still have to, you know, give it more thought in terms of like, what exactly um, am I, um, you know, what I'm, what exactly I'm going to do and how is this all going to work out? Uh, are there any? There's, uh, there's comments in the chat from Lisa, yeah. from Paulina, okay. and from, from uh, Nina. Anybody want to bring your comment in the chat to, to the yeah, so Lisa, Yeah, so Lisa said um, about the physical appearance of the stimulus and the I am condition. Yeah, so that's definitely, um, that's definitely a really good comment. It is, you know, it's very difficult, uh, it, you know, to relate to something, to something that, to a stimulus that looks nothing like you or, you know, it's, so, you know, if you're a man and it's a picture of a woman, you know, uh, it's, it might not, it might not evoke the same sort of stimulus. So that's, um, so that's something um, that I would also have to like work through and see, you know, would it even work at all? Or, you know, is this, or, you know, is this something that I'm going to have to be more, um, I'm going to have to be more selective about the participants so that way I don't have to try to create millions of different types of, <laughs> of stimuli uh, to try to, you know, get at everything. Um, someone else, Hebrew or English? Ming Zhuan? Um, no, I, I'm replying to the Polina's question. Oh, okay. Lee, there was also a comment by, by Lisa. Uh, Lisa, go ahead. Yes, please. Um, well, it's not visible in English, but I believe, I don't speak Russian, but I think adjectives will be gendered as well. So that might be like even more of a factor for the idea. Yeah, yeah. No, Russia, like I chose Russian for this example just simply because of uh, the audience here. Uh, but Spanish and French. I mean, there's, there are a couple of languages that. Yeah. And that adjectives. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so that's also, yeah, so yeah, gender languages is also like another, um, it, you know, that's also another problem that I would have to like work through, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, <laughs> there are a lot of things that need to be worked through. Uh, Polina. Yeah, thank you so much. That was uh, very interesting and exciting. But did you, I, I'm just wondering whether you were talking about like balanced bilinguals or bilinguals who acquire, like learned a second language. And my question is actually about like, what are we expecting from like heritage speakers? How those people would behave in this respect? Like, would we expect any differences in like the, age of acquisition of the language? Um, yes, so finding balanced bilinguals in the United States is pretty difficult. Um, so 
uh, you know, for example, myself, um, I am a heritage speaker of Korean, but my English is much stronger. So uh, despite the fact that like technically I learned Korean first, um, I would always personally categorize English as my L1 and Korean as my L2. Um, so, uh, you know, you know, in the study, um, I will probably uh, be looking at unbalanced uh, speak, uh, unbalanced bilingual speakers, but, you know, um, the recruiting would be done with people who have uh, what I, you know, right now I'm just sort of loosely saying is they're going to have sufficient proficiency in the language. Um, so what exactly that sufficient proficiency will, will means, um, I will decide later, but, you know, these will be people who are able to, like, converse fairly easily in the language and, you know, um, have a fair amount of um, cultural knowledge about that language um, in order to, you know, in order to do this study. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and I would imagine just simply based upon my own um, experience with, you know, other heritage speakers such as myself is that, um, you know, despite the fact that technically you have exposure to both languages from first, um, a lot of us really treat our heritage language more as like a later acquisition of the second language. Um, you know, there's, there's greater similarities of second acquisitions in, in, in sort of like many of these cognitive factors. I think it would be just interesting to see whether this actually matters or not, whether they are ex diff uh, the same, like L2 speakers yeah. that are late acquisition and uh, heritage languages, or maybe there is some, as always with heritage speakers, yeah. there is something <laughs> better yeah. in them with yeah. With no, uh, you, no, you bring up a really interesting point, um, and, you know, definitely... Uh, you know, on Long Island, there certainly are a fair number of heritage speakers, um, and you know, certainly that they would be recruited. But I, th you know, exactly what the languages are, what everything is going to be look like. Um, you know, these are all very good. These are all very good. You know, procedural questions that I haven't fully worked out yet because I'm still like still wrestling and thinking about the more theoretical stuff first. Um, and I just really wanted to um, present this. Uh, as a way of one working out through my thoughts and like um, and hearing what other people uh, have to say um, and contribute because um, you know in the past I used to have a lab you know it, when I was a postdoc where you know I could just talk to other graduate students and talk to my advisor and like sort of bounce ideas off of and um, you know uh, I don't have that same sort of uh, immediate sense of community uh, anymore. So uh, this, you know, so when John asked me if I was I wanted to, pre to present um, a lecture, uh, I was very happy to do it. But I was just like, I don't have any research that I've done, but I would be, I would love to use this opportunity to just sort of like bounce ideas off of because I've been really missing community, um, especially with the pandemic. Um, and the, you know, I'm, I'm finding this really fun because this is like, oh, like I, I, I get to just talk about ideas for the sheer intellectual love of um, of research. Uh, all right. Uh, Maria, how does the uh, level of fluency in L2 influence the results of the study? Um, that is a really good question. Uh, sorry about that. Bandit! That's my dog. Um, so, you know, uh, th this question of fluency is um, something that always comes up in bilingual speakers uh, because, you know, a lot of these, you know, effects that people, um, that uh, researchers are trying to argue that is coming, um, you know, people always say, well, maybe it's just because you know, it's more effort, it's cognitively more difficult uh, to uh, express yourself in the second language, um, particularly if you're not as fluent. And so maybe all of these various different effects that we're finding is just really an effect of fluency rather than, you know, a true effect. And so, um, uh, so, you know, people try to get around that by, uh, you know, recruiting people who are more fluent uh, in 
uh, the second language. So, you know, again, this idea of like, they need to reach some sort of like um, level of proficiency. Um, and generally, uh, the people, you know, the people, uh, the people who are recruited for these bilingual studies are people where, yes, um, you know, they acquired L2 later on in life, but, you know, it, it would, you know, they're in a situation where, like, you know, their first language is perhaps Korean, and then they came over here to the United States, they know English, they oper- they use English every day, like, you know, so you can make the argument that, um, you know, that they're, f- they're, they might not be, a, they might not have native fluency in L2, but they certainly have, you know, very good fluency and proficiency in L2 that, you know, so saying that, you know, this is all just because everything is just a little bit harder, you know, is, is, a, is a more difficult argument to make. But, you know, that's certainly something that's always in the back of people's minds um, that they're thinking of is that, you know, what if this is all just nothing, you know, just has to do with the fact that, you know, L2, even if you are very proficient, it's just always going to be harder. Uh, John. Oh, um, I think Lisa also has another question. I just, um, <clears throat> I'm interested in, at the very beginning, you showed a, a slide um, with like distribution of expressive, expressivity, mm-hmm. however you pronounce that, of the different, of various languages, not, it didn't claim to have all languages, but it had a bunch of languages, right? Yeah. Um, and that was sort of as part of the build up to what you were trying to um, work on. And um, can you, I, I mean, I, the details, are, it's not about the particulars of that slide, but um, what I missed maybe uh, is what, like, is that, where does that, like, where is that? Yeah, you're gonna show it to us. Okay, great. Yeah, there we go. Um, so this is from, so how is this, like, I don't know. I mean, obviously this is not, this is from Aaron Meyer, I guess, down source it says at the bottom. So this mm-hmm. comes from, this comes from a source and I don't know how much you know about that source, but I'm really curious on how this kind of thing is determined. And why are these, the why do we have these two axes? Like, why is it emotional expressiveness and plus or minus confrontation, if we can call it plus or minus, rather than 12 other things? Like, you know, what, and what kind of, like, how is this, because this is really important. This is the starting point for the comparison. And I'm, I'm just, you know, a little skeptical on it when I see a thing like this, because why these categories? How, how do you plot an entire culture or country on a graph like this? Like, you know, and you said yourself that native speakers are going to definitely in some cases think, no, that doesn't, that's not how I feel about my language, you know? So I'm really curious about what the methodology, whatever you know about what the methodology behind this is. Thanks. And also I'm good. If I leave during your answer, I'm still listening. I just have to, um, <laughs> yeah. Multitasking, you know, um, but that's what I'm curious about how this is determined. Yeah, so um, this is probably not going to end up being the basis on which uh, I will end up categorizing uh, the languages and cultures that I end up using. Um, This is just like the first thing that I happened to find when I was doing this. Um, And the reason why confrontational uh, was used was because this study was actually looking at negotiation and business deals. (laughs) So, so that's why they use these um, axes. Um, so this is probably not the most appropriate one for me for my study, but it was like the easiest one that I could find for right now. And I'm just using this as a starting point until I can uh, find a better model that I want to use that. But I think, um, you know, but um, emotionally expressive just simply has to do with, you know, the outward facial um, expressions and, um, and how readily people emote. Um, and so, uh, you know, that is definitely, um, so that is something that I'm interested in, but what the other characteristic is for my study in the future, um, I don't know at this point, but the reason why they chose it was because they were doing negotiations. Um, and I don't, um, and I don't re- call off hand exactly how they uh, did it, but um, generally in these types of studies, when, you know, find these characteristics, um, it has to do with ratings. Um, so it's probably just people um, in their studies saying like, you know, you know, you personally, how would you rate on how emotionally expressive you are, um, you know, as a group, 
you know, how emotionally expressive do you think, you know, your group is? So that, that's usually how things are done. Thank you. Um, yep. I'm going to Lisa and thanks Lillian so much. Um, we, discussion continues. Yes, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you. Um, actually, I also wanted to comment on this graph. Like it, you just said, it's not going to be the basis of your experiment. I just wanted to add, I think the problem is that we list countries rather than languages or cultural groups. So that might not be something you can work on. Yeah. So they, yeah. So they use uh, countries rather than languages because, um, you know, the uh, so if you look here, uh, United States and UK, you know, um, both of these countries uh, have English as the, you know, as their main language. But you can see is that um, they very much differ on confrontational. So Americans are seen as being far more direct compared to. Um, yeah. The British people, despite the fact that they must speak the same language. So that's the reason why countries were used rather than languages. Just in the US, you have many Spanish speakers, Spanish speakers, and so on. So I mean, mm -hmm. it's problematic in both ways. But actually, that brings me to my sec oh, my, my question <laughs> would be um, now I also realize you, you don't want to, or maybe it's not going to be Russian, the target language. Russian as an example here, and um, you say we expect the, oh, I forgot the name of this, the FP. Fact labeling. Um, no, the reaction. <laughs> uh, uh, what is it? This red line. <laughs> this? Uh, or there's the a slide before this one. The slide before this one. Oh, the late, uh, the late positive potential. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So you no. expect this um, line to, to mm -hmm. change because in Russia, or according to this graphic, Rus Russian people, Russian speakers are more expressive. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, is it, we, we and I'll have to know if the speaker has also cultural attachment to this language. If, if say I learn Russian at school, I might learn the language, but not um, how people behave in Russian might not affect how it click in Russian. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if I. No, 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 you're bringing, no, you're, you, you're bringing a really good point. And, and, and you know, that's definitely true because, um, uh, you know, just because. It, uh, you know, just because you're learning a language, you know, when, you know, when I'm teaching a class on language, you know, what I, what I often make very clear to my students is that it, just because you know the grammar of the language doesn't mean you actually know how to speak the language. Uh, because yeah, you language, have exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So there's, you know, every culture has a particular way in which you know, there are expectations of how you're supposed to behave and how you're supposed to say certain things. And, you know, I experience this all the time when I go to my visit my family in Korea. Despite the fact that, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with my grammar, you know, people can, you know, people can figure out really quickly. I don't even have to open up my mouth. People can figure out I'm an American um, just simply by the way, you know, I was because I you know, I was walking with my cousin and all of the vendors were trying to sell their chopskis to me and they were leaving him alone because they knew he's, he, he lives there. He's not going to buy some sort of souvenir. So they were all coming to me. And I was like asking him, like, why would they bother me? Why don't they ever bother you? And I'm, and I'm like, they can't tell that I'm American. I haven't said anything to them. And he looked at me and he's just like, Oh no! They can tell them just by looking. You walk like an American. <laughs> like, so there is a whole way of being um, to be, a, you know, a speaker of, you know, to be a fluent speaker of that culture. You do need to acquire, um, you know, the cultural and societal baggage that comes with the language if you want to be sort of be accepted as one of the fluent speakers. Um, so, 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that, you know, I would see some, you know, that it would be different that if I were to get somebody who only learned Russian or, you know, whatever those languages, only learned it in the classroom, never visited the country, never acquired any of the cultural um, baggage, uh, that, it, you know, then it would definitely, you know, I would definitely expect to see more of like this emotional detachment. So I do think that, you know, um, you know, when in all of these bilingual uh, studies, you know, you you also try to get a measure of, um, you know, the cultural acquisition, like how much of the culture, uh, you know, that they personally themselves are saying of, like I have knowledge of, and you know, um, and uh, and it's some sort of emotional attachment to. And I definitely think that's important um, because you know, if I'm, you know, because if I'm saying that, you know, there's this relationship with the emotion, then there needs you know, they they need to have some sort of affiliation with that language, not just sort of like this classroom, uh, you know, this classroom knowledge. Holly. Yes. Um, I have a question about um, the, I don't know how to, how I would frame this, um, like the fluctuations in emotion that might affect the way someone perceives the, a, a picture that they're looking at. So I can imagine that one day, if I have some sort of terrible day, I would look at a picture and I would see my own emotions in, in that face. And mm -hmm. then the next day I might have a very good day and it would register in a completely different way. So is that something that you would have to factor into your study or can you, um, does that affect it in any, in any way, or is that just, um, I, so I, you know, I, this is what, this is, yeah. So and you bring up a really good point that as an experimental psychologist, like I worry about, and it really pains me because, um, what you're talking about actually is a real problem, but it's not a problem that I, know how to solve uh and you know the standard response that everybody uh you know in my field uh how we try to address this is just by saying well that's why we have large sample sizes because the, you know the idea here is that you, you know what you're introducing is what we very ungenerously call noise and the 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 hope is just that by having a large sample size somehow this hope wipes out but i mean i think you're bringing up a really good point um and and i don't know what to do i, I honestly don't know what to do about it um and don't how worry to solve about it, it Lily, and you can tell i'm not a scientist so. yeah. but, <laughs> i just yeah. put all my cards on the table and everyone will know oh she's not the scientist <laughs> no you're bringing you're honestly bringing up a really good point and this is actually something that we we think about and worry about but like nobody has an answer to other than but let's just hope that having, you know, large sample size will fix all that. That's sort of like the standard, there's sort of like the standard set of tools that as experimental psychologists that we have, and we just bring them out over and over again. Uh, and that might be part of our problem is that, you know, these tools that we're bringing in might not be sufficient. Um, and, you know, we need to think about these problems more deliberately uh, to try to address them rather than saying, well, you know, this is how we solved it in the past, and we'll just keep on using them. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, all right, so let's take a look at the comments. Um, is there are, are there any other questions in the comments that I should? Uh, yeah, Natalia. Oh, so Nicole uh, made a comment about, um, yeah, in, in the classroom, good, all right, and fine were all synonyms, but then moving to the UK and answering fine sounded very passive aggressive. Yeah, and certainly, you know, different countries have different um, ways of conveying information. You know, in the United States, if you said fine, um, it would be, I mean, depending upon your tone of voice, it probably would be just fine. Um, but you know, I saw a very funny uh, TikTok video where they were talking about the differences between American uh, um, 
the cultural differences between American English and British English and how the British English was far more understated. So um, all, all of the, the, in these British jokes, uh, the, the Americans weren't getting them because they were just too subtle for us. And so, you know, so the person was trying to explain, they're like, oh, if somebody tells you great, especially if they tell you great twice, it's really not good. And we're all like, why? <laughs> like, because, you know, and I think this is part of like the whole difference in terms of like confrontational uh, in the United States, you know, in the American culture, it's more socially acceptable for you to say more of what's on your mind, whereas in the British culture, um, my husband used to do business uh, in London, and he said that it took him, um, you know, a, a couple months to figure out that all of these that fairly what he used to think were fairly positive things from his British bosses were actually not positive at all. And they were telling him very subtly that they thought, you know, his ideas were, you know, not that good. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so cultures can vary and you have to be sensitive uh, to this. Any other questions or comments? All right, uh, there's one more message. Bottom. Oh, uh, the American, I am so happy to do this. It's very confusing to you as a Russian. Uh, so why is it confusing to you, Polina? Because I was told that this just means like, okay, and I'm, I'm gonna do this but whenever I hear happy I think oh this person really wants to do this <laughs> so yeah and I think um this yeah it also has to do with like again different languages and cultures um have uh, you know different ways of expressing yeah so yes uh, as an American I'm happy to do this doesn't necessarily mean that you're thrilled to do it it's, it's just a polite way of saying that you're willing to do it um, I can never imagine a Russian person saying in Russian I'm happy to do this unless they're really excited <laughs> yeah um and and I think you know but that has to do yeah it, it, you know that again has to do with different appropriate you know again like just knowing the grammar doesn't make you a, you know, doesn't actually make you a fluent speaker of the language is that, you know, if I, even if I were to learn Russian fluently, but speak Russian, uh, using the same sort of like way in ways in which I would express things in English. So, you know, um, it would just sound very odd. Like, you know, when I was learning, um, I took Korean, uh, in college, um, because I wanted to improve my Korean and um, the class, you know, uh, it was like 75% heritage speakers and 25% um, white Americans who were learning Korean for whatever reason. Um, and that was the very first time, like when I was learning French, my teachers would always tell me, you speak French, but you speak it like an American, not like a French person. And I, and I never really quite understood that, but that was the first time when I, I was really able to understand it because all of the Amer um, the white American speakers who are learning Korean, all of the sentence were grammatically correct, but no one in Korea and none of the heritage speakers, we would never say it that way. We would always phrase it in a different way. So it really has to do with, under you know, how would a person, how would a native speaker in that language, how would they say that? And that is a much harder thing to learn until you're in the environment and you're learning how to say things in that particular way. I mean, one of my um, proudest moments, because I learned French in a classroom when I went to go nanny in Belgium for a while. Um, and I was super proud when I was in France and I was speaking French and the cashier who is, um, who I was interacting with looked at me and he says, oh, you learned French in Belgium. <laughs> like I was, I was so proud of myself because I was like, yes, like I learned how to express myself in French, but like as a Belgian person, because I had been living there for a while. And, you know, that made me feel really good. Um, and that is something uh, you know, and, and, and that, and that is, you know, that doesn't happen in the classroom that happens in the environment. And that is something that you can't replicate in a classroom. So 
Anything else? All right. Well, um, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, being here with you. I, I really had a lot of fun. Um, it, it, it's just been so joyful uh, just to you know share my ideas and, and talk to you. Uh, yes, Polina. I was just clapping. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm not fully conversant in Zoom, despite the fact that I've been teaching in this one for a year. All my students are like, no, professor, you got to do something. Like, my students will walk me through things because I'm just like, I don't understand. There are too many buttons here for me. Lillian, thank you. I would like to thank you myself for um, your lecture, for answering questions, for informing and amusing and you know all of these things that you have done for us in the last I guess hour and a half or something um it was it was great and it's great to see you again and I'm really happy <laughs> and I mean that I'm really happy that you came and and uh presented this lecture I, I, you know, I was so happy uh, to be invited back. And honestly, I had no idea. I had such a wonderful time in St. Petersburg that I had full expectations that I was going to return back in a few years. I really did. And I, it, you know, and in a blink of an eye, nine years has passed. Um, yes, many so. of us have that same experience. <laughs> so we are, we're glad to be here, you know, and um, at least we have this, this, venue, our little Zoom space for, for being able to hold NYI in another form. Um, we're very adaptable, let's just say. Yes, that. yes. So, you know, I really hope uh, to see you again in person, um, and I really hope to uh, come back um, well before nine years. Thank um, you so much. And, you know, thank you for having me, and, you know, um, and uh, I hope to see you guys. Um, I'll, I will show up for another one of these uh, talks uh, for somebody else, but as an audience member, just because, you know, this has just been so much fun. And I, 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 re I really have. Uh, I really did enjoy myself. And I, and I really do love, you know, this intellectual community um, that's created, um, you know, you, John, everybody, the staff, um, you guys do such an amazing job. And the students are always, you guys are so fantastic. And it, it's just so lovely being here. And, and I mean that. That's that's a, that's not an American <laughs> positive emotion. That's a real sincere positive emotion for me. Okay. Well, thank you so much.